what I want to talk to you about today is what are, why we're doing a community garden and then we're going to talk about some other projects that we're going to be launching in the fall as part of our campus living lab project. So the question that I've been getting a lot after this poster started going up was why are you calling it a slow food community garden? What does slow food mean? And I, I'm not the genius who came up with that unfortunately. It is actually an international movement that is about slowing down and not eating fast food. It's about taking the time to grow your own food, cook your food as a family, and share your meals as a family. And one of the posters that I'm gonna be sharing with you um, at the end of the presentation, one of the items is family. And a student asked me, why is that on there? I was like, well, when you're in the car eating McDonald's, Big Mac, on your way to soccer practice, do you feel like you're having family time? And she's like, oh my gosh, that makes perfect sense. So the slow food movement and why we're calling our community garden the slow food community garden is teaching us to step back, take a deep breath, and spend time with family and friends, grow our own food, and maintain a healthy lifestyle. So like, I, like this uh, slide says, it is a global movement about slowing down. So, what does this mean to us as Americans? Well, this movie came out several years ago called Food, Inc. How many of y'all saw this? Just a couple? Okay, this is gonna be enlightening. I really encourage you to watch the entire thing. It's on Netflix. Um, you can watch the entire thing. We're just gonna look at one small portion of it. And this is the Gonzalez family. And this is why, this is why we need to move to a slow food concept. This family is on the go and they talk about the health implications of being in a fast food society. So let's take, this is called, this portion of the movie is called The Dollar Menu. tied to the kind of agriculture that we're practicing and the kind of farm policies we have. 
all those snack food calories are the ones that come from the commodity crops, from the wheat, from the corn, and from the soybeans. By making those calories really cheap, that's one of the reasons that the biggest predictor of obesity is income level. Over the course of human history, we were struggling to make sure we had enough food and enough calories for a sizable percentage of the human race now. The problem is too many calories. The industry blames obesity on a crisis of personal responsibility. But when you're engineering foods, you are pressing our evolutionary buttons. I mean, the fact is we're hardwired to go for three tastes, salt, fat, and sugar. These things are very rare in nature. Now sugar is, you know, available 24-7 in tremendous quantities. We're, we're eating hundreds of pounds of this stuff a year. This diet of high fructose corn syrup and refined carbohydrates leads to these spikes of insulin and gradually a wearing down of the system by which our body metabolizes sugar. My husband's diabetic. One of my main concerns is he can lose his sight um, he, he does get into some, sometimes in shaky, so I'm afraid that he's going to start not being able to drive because that's what he does for a profession. We have to consider his medicine. What is it, $70? 50 pills come in by $130. But he's on two different types of pills, 100 and something for one pill and then 100 and something for another. That takes a lot of our income away. We're really tight from either paying for his medicine to be healthy or buying vegetables to be healthy. So which one should we do? It's hard to see my dad suffering with diabetes and stuff like that. And it's really sad to see that probably my sister might have it. Is there something that's going on in the way that we, that, that we live our lives and where we play and where we buy our food and the types of food that we're able to buy that is causing this epidemic? And it's not just our community. It's not just Walter Park. It's everywhere. How many of us know one person in our family with diabetes? How about two? Three? It used to be that type 2 diabetes only affected adults. And now it's affecting children at epidemic proportions. So what do y'all think? Is it frightening? How many of you have diabetes? Really? Nobody? That's awesome. How many people do you know who have diabetes? A lot. So this family is really stuck in a vicious cycle. Um, they don't have the money, they don't feel they have the money to eat healthy, and they also don't have the money, the money that they spend on the medication from not eating, eating healthy keeps them from eating healthy. So it's, it's a huge conundrum. So I started doing some research on the statistics of obesity in America. And this is one of the reasons why we felt like a community garden was so beneficial to our campus. Um, when you look at this from the New York Times, it talks about the cost of food and beverages over the years. And if you look at the chart, the fresh fruits have gotten higher since just 1978 to 2008, whereas the really bad foods, the sodas, have decreased in prices. And one of the things that Michael Pollan pointed out, um, Michael Pollan is like the food guru of, um, of this uh, millennium so far. One of the points he made was the reason why the fruits and vegetables are more expensive is because they're not subsidized by the federal government. High fructose corn syrup that is in all of our sodas and unfortunately that I provided and all the chips that I provided. Um, those are heavily subsidized by the federal government. So when the government says, we're going to pay you a lot of money to grow corn, a lot of farmers um, tilled under their other crops to grow more corn because they could make more money growing corn. And if you watch the entire movie, Food Inc., the very beginning, one of the very first um, 
parts of it talks about the corn subsidies and what corn is in. Corn is in diapers, it is in batteries, it is in fuel, the ethanol that is in our gasoline. So corn is everywhere and that's part of the reason why sodas have de decreased so much in cost and fruits and vegetables have increased because they're not subsidized by the government. And this was rather frightening how obesity has grown over the years because a lot of this is because of the subsidies. Um, you notice back in 1991, Texas had, what, 10 to 14 percent obesity rate. In 2009, 25 to 29 percent of our population was considered obese. I mean, and gosh, look at the this section here, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, um, no, it's not Georgia, um, Alabama. Thank you, Alabama. Uh, over 30% obesity rates. So when I was putting this, pres this, this presentation, I had set up uh, another time, so I updated it just last week. And these are the new numbers. They're now, the CDC is looking at obesity from a different self what did they call it, a self-reporting um, obesity. So people who perceive themselves as being obese. So in 2011, uh, let's see, 30 to 35% of Texans thought they were obese. But in 2012, that had decreased to 25 to 30%. Still, that's over a quarter of our population considers themselves obese. What do you think that real number really is? Higher. <laughs> yeah, it's probably much higher, which is, is very, very sad to say. So there's some startling, startling numbers um, that we're facing in America. What else does this affect? Our children, absolutely. Um, because we're feeding them all, we're in this fast food society. So some of the questions that have been posed by this movie, um, what factors influence the Gonzalez's family's choices? Income. Their income, what else? Time. And time. Fast food, slow food. We're a very, very fast society. I hear a lot about children being overscheduled. I talk to my friends and they're like, oh, we're on our way to basketball practice. Oh, we're on our way to ballet. Every single day their children are involved in something. And just taking time to slow down. And, and eat a meal together. But what types of food costs less than fresh fruit and vegetables? The junk food. And that's, that was illustrated in their section. So Michael Pollan says, we've skewed our food system to the bad choices and it's not an accident. What does that mean? What are we, why is that skewed? Did you catch that? I think it keeps the economy going. I mean, you eat the bad food, then you have to go to the doctor, that keeps them going. And you, know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it just, it's just. And that's vicious. absolutely correct because according to the big economists, our economy has to grow by two to 4% annually in order to keep from going into a, um, a depression. So, we got to keep that we got to keep that economic engine going whether it's war you know starting up that war machine or growing food those subsidies got to keep these companies now have you ever looked at the cereal shelf it's oh my gosh there is so much to it and then the organic stuff it's like this one little sliver over here and it's really expensive but you take away all the chemicals and the stuff's really expensive and you put all the chemicals in and it's less expensive? <laughs> that really, really does not um, compute to me sometimes. So that's how the farm subsidies affect the price of food. The really junky stuff has corn in it. Or soy. Or soy. The soybeans, yes. Um, so that stuff is very, very inexpensive. So why might income be a predictor of obesity? Because if your income is low, you can't afford the fruits and vegetables which are probably higher. Do you think that's real? 
Or do you think that's a perception thing? It's a perception. So. Because they could get two Bartlett pears, right? For a dollar, or they could get a cheeseburger for a dollar. But I guess if you're in that fast food mentality, that just makes more sense to just go through the drive-through and setting the Bartlett's. But that's, but that's also reality is, like Michael Pollan said, you can't buy a headed lettuce for the same price that you can buy two cheeseburgers. So it's, it's very, very skewed. So we wanna help, um, as, a, as a college, we wanna help our community be um, more healthy. So again, the health impact, uh, like Sharon said, send you to the doctor and then you take medication. So now who's benefiting? The pharmaceutical industries who now advertise on television, uh, Earth Day Texas, that we just had this weekend. I got into a conversation with a student about, you know, now these people have these illnesses that they never realized they had before until they started seeing these things. Oh, if you suffer from this, you need to go to your doctor and get this medication. And that medication causes something else. And again, you've got another vicious cycle. So. The good news is the federal government's on it. <laughs> Back in 1990, uh, before, I mean, we were already seeing the, the, the fast food really starting to take over. But in 1990, the federal government, the FDA, decided that we needed some kind of a nutrition labeling on our processed food because it was becoming more and more part of our um, eating style. So this is the original. Uh, the original nutrition label that's on all packaged food. Do you recognize that? Yeah. So in so what was what was happening was if you see up at the top where it says the serving size and then it says servings per container. So this and I, I don't know what this is from, but it says servings per con, per container is eight. Well, they kind of skewed it. You look at the calories. Most people weren't multiplying that 230 by eight. So you could eat an entire bag of Fritos and you thought perceiving that you were only um, intaking 230 calories, 40 calories from fat, um, whereas what is 230 times eight? Any mathematicians? Um, a lot. Yeah. So in just in February, just two months ago, the FDA um, are trying, they have ish, they're in a public hearing cycle right now for 90 days, so another, another month, um, to get the food labeling changed. So now um, it says the serving size and the calories is larger. So it's not quite so, it's, they, I don't think they were really trying to be deceptive. I really want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but they're going to make it bigger so that you can see that. And so you can see with the saturated fat and the trans fat. So the numbers come first before the words. So that everything stands out a little bit better. Hopefully, um, according to the article um, that um, from the FDA, from their website, hopefully this will be instituted by the end of the year. Will this be helpful? Folks that don't read labels don't care what size it is. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be think very it's helpful. I mean, the FDA is government also. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, now, you know, McDonald's tell you how much, mm -hmm. how many calories, what have you. But that's right. That's on the menus now. That's right. Have not mm -hmm. gone down since they started telling no, you calories. No, not at all. Not at all. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. So, so what do we do? <gasps> we help you. <laughs> Ta-da! By introducing our slow food community garden, we're calling it a food revolution at Mountain View College. Uh, thanks to Morgan and our facilities department. Jimmy, thank you very, very much. We broke ground on our new community garden uh, just two weeks, less than two weeks ago, about 10 days ago. Uh, it's right outside um, the handicapped parking lot by the um, W building and the S building. There's a big empty space. Have they started digging the trench? Uh, no, yeah, they may or may not be here today. Huh? Okay. Very, very soon, you will notice a fence go up around this big scraped area. And um, that is where our community garden is going to be installed. This is a very, very basic 
outline of what it's going to look like, but we're going to do a lot of teaching here. This is going to be a fantastic opportunity for you to grow food and for you to learn about why it's important to grow food. We have lots of professors who are on board all across the curriculum who want to be involved in this. So this, this garden at first is going to be 40 beds. Some of the beds will be designated as learning gardens. They will be available for adoption by some of the student clubs and then the professors can bring their students out any time during the year um, to do soil testing, um, look at the growth rates, they can, anything, anything they want um, out there. So not only will we be growing food, um, we're, or not only are we going to have the learning beds, but we're also going to make beds available for leasing. We want faculty and staff and students and the local community to come in and lease beds and grow their own food here on campus. It will be fenced, so uh, everything will hopefully be safe from uh, vandals, um, the people who come in the middle of the night and take all the food that has happened at some local community gardens. Don't do that. Um, and it'll keep out the critters from the woods. So we think that this is gonna be a really, really um, safe environment. It's gonna have some fruit trees that'll be available if you see, hopefully when they just take a apple or a pear or whatever we end up growing and eat it while you're while you're working in your garden um, there's going to be a composting area where we're going to be teaching about composting um, this is going to be organic no pesticides herbicides allowed in this garden so everything will be organic we'll be doing composting courses vermicomposting which is composting uh, food scraps using worms which is so cool um, we're going to have two tool sheds we're going to provide all the tools that you need and on the sides of these tool sheds will be rain barrels so we'll be doing very very small scale um, rainwater harvesting and that's mostly going to be an educational tool we know that it's not very large it's only 40 beds so in addition to this we're also going to be teaching courses throughout the year through continuing education on how to do this in your own yard we're going to have nutrition classes cooking classes I'm going to finally learn how to cook. Um, <laughs> my daughter will be so glad. Um, so this is really going to be an amazing project. Um, but let's go a little bit further and make it a little bit bigger. In addition to that, we are, did you know we have a greenhouse on campus? Yep. The greenhouse is being renovated over the summer and in the fall the STEM grant is going to pay for us to install an aquaponics lab which will give us an opportunity to grow more food on campus using water, rocks, and fish poop. <laughs> and it is going to be so cool. Take up two thirds of the greenhouse. So the CAD department has agreed to come up with a plan as a special project in the fall for their students. They're going to develop a drawing for somebody to create a single unit, aquaponics. And then we're going to bring the community in and teach them how to create their own small aquaponics unit at their own house. And we're also going to get the Spanish Honors Society involved and they can help translate to our local community as we're teaching these courses. So can you say food revolution at Mountain View College? So this is really, really going to be exciting. Who has any questions about this? Is there a wow. okay, like local okay. aquaponics lab around here? There, I know there's one in Carrollton. Not that I'm aware of. There's one in Fort Worth that um, the company that, we're, that we've been ta speaking to, uh, Green Phoenix Farms, they just built an aquaponics lab at a church. And actually, there's, theirs is not a lab. They're actually growing food for the homeless community. Yes? Down in the high school area, what do you call that? Right, that is one. They have one. That's right, they have the two small units. Um, Ms. Tyeski, one of the biology teachers, has two small units. And so I took uh, Steve Billingsley, our CAD professor, down there, and he was like, oh, yeah, I can just make this a special project. So it's, it's very, very exciting. Once you show people what you're talking about, the excitement really um, has been 
all over the campus. It's going to be really, really neat. So, actually, so these are some of the topics. When I started going to the professors, um, one of the first professors I went to was um, a debate speech professor. And he's like, Lori, he goes, I really don't understand how I can work aquaponics into my class. So I had developed a, um, a matrix, a curriculum matrix. And y'all can, I didn't, it's not very big, I'm sorry. But these are all the topics that the different courses can discuss. I have the government teachers on board. We can talk about immigration issues when it comes to large scale farming, um, OSHA, the pet, the food safety, we can talk about engineering, technology using the CAD, uh, soil amendments, we're bringing in biology and chemistry, biodiversity, the beneficial bugs, um, the uh, breakdown of the compost, organic versus genetically modified, and then here's that family that started that conversation at Earth Day, Dallas, or Earth Day Texas over the weekend. But there's more. Those are just two elements of what we're calling the living laboratory that is going to be Mountain View College starting this fall. In addition to the, um, those two projects, we're going to be offering green building accreditation through USGBC, US Green Building Council, through continuing education. And um, the engineering students are going to have an opportunity to work, work with facilities to do energy performance audits, waste <coughs> audits, and uh, learn some hands-on things down in our operations center. So, wow, this is going to be a really, really exciting year. So these are some ways that I'd like for you to keep up with the latest news on what's happening with these projects. Um, I don't call it social media anymore, now it's social learning. So if you'd like to download um, any or all of these apps, um, we will be keeping um, everybody on campus up to date using these and also through our website. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me directly. So, questions? Those Bless. social media mm -hmm. things, will you send out an email telling us what they are? Absolutely, yes. And even if you go to our uh, campus website, mountainviewcollege.edu slash sustainability project, on the side there's links to every single one of those. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay, so I heard you say as students we can get involved through student clubs and organizations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any, any way we can get in like individually if let's say your club doesn't want to participate? Like how do you help individually? We will work out something. We've not divvied up the, the plot yet. Um, I need to get with Student Life and figure out the best way which clubs might be interested. Um, and we can, you know, if there's just a whole bunch of you who just want to do it individually, these are really big plots. They're like, what are they, Jimmy? 16 by 4? Yeah, 16 by 4. So they're really large. So I would recommend going in as groups to do that because remember, y'all aren't here all year long. So we need people, you know, who are willing to come out and work as a group to maintain it over the summer. Because that's when you're going to get your biggest harvest. I mean, we're talking about having harvest feasts, having entire parties out there, really bringing Mountain View together with our entire community through these projects. So if you're interested, um, talk to Eric Sanders and Kathy. And um, as we start building this program over the summer, um, it's all going to come together. Just not real sure how yet. But it will, I promise. So August, the week of return week, August 18th, that week we're going to have our ribbon cutting. Have you determined what the price is going to be for the various plots and if there's going to be identification on each plot? I don't want to say a price right now. I've got a, we've, we've been talking about a price, but we haven't actually settled on it yet. Um, I would like to say, let's say 15 to $30 a year. Sure's going no, so we won't say a price. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yes. By August. By August. Yeah, we'll know by August. We're working the contracts out with legal. Yeah. Yes, Denny. Uh, 
I practice hydroponics before. What's the difference between hydroponics and aquaponics? Okay, so the difference between hydroponics and aquaponics. Hydroponics is just using water. Aquaponics adds the fish element. So at the very beginning of this closed loop system, there's going to be this enormous tank of fish. We're going to use koi, the big, the large goldfish, and it's a pump system that'll pump that water that it has the nutrients already mixed into it, the nitrogen from the fish poop, that will work through the system. So it's, it automatically is adding your, your natural organic fertilizer. I thought the hydroponics used a chemical fertilizer with the water rather than a natural the hydroponics, I don't, the aquaponics does not. Aquaponics is what we're going to be doing, know, and it's completely natural. That's the difference, and you said it was just water, but it's, it can't be just water because it wouldn't. That's right, you would have to add some kind of a nutrient to it, yeah. So that's why we went, that's why we went with the aquaponics, because, and then we can eat the fish. Ooh. Koi. Koi? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Again, let's just strike that. <laughs> and they do some, some, I have heard this, you know, there's, we're hearing different things from different experts, you know, tilapia. Some people, uh, I talked to a couple over the weekend at Earth Day Texas who said they did catfish. Um, so, you know, it's going to be trial and error. We're going to try a lot of different things. Maybe we'll just eat the food that we grow and we'll just throw the fish out in the pond. <laughs> oh gosh, don't mess with my turtles. Okay. <laughs> Man, y'all are making this hard. Yes. So say we're interested, do we have to wait, like as students who are interested in help, do we have to wait until the garden is actually open or can we help, like start helping right now? Jimmy, can they start helping right now? Now I need to wait till it's so we're gonna have construction put them out there and oh, okay. so until it's open. Yeah. Oh okay. Okay. Any other questions? Well, let me, um, I have some books up here that y'all are welcome um, to take a look at. These are the books that I'm going to be making available to the faculty to assist them in teaching about this, um, about the food topic. And again, what I was telling people over Earth Day Texas all weekend was um, we are bringing sustainability down to its very basic level to food and then building our way back up. And that's how we're going to cover all those topics. So thank y'all again for coming and if you have any questions I'm happy to stay after and talk and stop by my office. Thank you.